Book Bites here at the Scott County Public Library in Georgetown, Kentucky. As always, I am Miss Kelly. This is Miss Mary Lou. Hello. Um, elephant in the room. Yeah, we're filming this on Halloween. So Happy Halloween. Yes, yeah. I'm dressed up like a peacock, and Mary Lou has her very festive. Uh, just yeah, my sweatshirt. sweatshirt. It's just on. my Halloween sweatshirt. Yes, I don't. I'm not a big costume person. I am. It's so much fun. She yes. Um, but uh, what we're talking about today is books uh, set in the Cold War. So scary stuff. These are good scary books. Yeah. 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 Uh, Cold War. Not, not yeah. fun. Good, fun books. Interesting uh, books. Really yes. Interesting yeah. Books. Yeah. Yeah. You want to start? I think you have one more than me. Do I? Okay. Well, the first one I'm going to talk about, I, you know, I'm kind of doing a Kelly this time. I have not finished this book. <laughs> I finished all three I'm of my books this time. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> this one, um, I started it yesterday, just yesterday, mm -hmm. and I'm about 50 pages in, and it's called Fallout, and it's written by Steve Scheinkin, who is one of the best writers of fiction, of nonfiction for young people. He has won so many awards. He's won, he's won so many awards, and um, I, you know, I, I want to say that this it, book would be appropriate for people on the older end of the tween spectrum. Uh, it, this is in our teen collection. Uh, Shaikin's stuff is, is pretty complex, but what I love about him is he, he, you feel like you're reading a really good novel. Mm -hmm. And the first book, the book, this is a, a sequel to <clears throat> this book that won a million awards called Bomb. Graphic novel version coming soon. Yes, and this uh, Bomb, which has so many stickers you on it from old doors <laughs> that you almost can't see the cover. But this is about um, the development of the first nuclear bomb, the atom bomb, during World War II. This is the sequel of what happened in that whole um, military science complex uh, concerning weapons after the after World War II. <clears throat> this is during the Cold War. This very much captures what the Cold War is about. Um, I, I was telling Kelly, I don't like this book. I don't like reading it. And if I could have stayed up all night reading it, I would not have put it down because it, it reads like the best thriller. But it's real and it's really scary stuff when you think about um, after World War II, the, during the Cold War, everyone was waiting for a nuclear war. They, everyone really, they were, the United States and Russia, and I just want to do this kind of little background here. Mm. They Soviet Union. Soviet Union. I think they became the Soviet Union after World War II, right? Or were they during that? I think it, I, I think after the fallout, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Soviet, the the, uh, the after 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 World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States, they have been allies during the war. And then our that, flamingos are on opposite sides yes. of the war. Today. And as soon as the war was over, the Soviet Union lost so many soldiers during the war. They they were right on the front lines with Germany. And the losses were tremendous, and they felt that they had a right to claim all the territory that they could get after the war. And so the way the world, the, the way that Europe was sort of divided up was between Eastern Europe, which are all countries that then the Soviet Union controlled through, through a pretty oppressive communist governments, and then Western Europe, which rebuilt their democracies after so many of them had been um, occupied by the Nazis. And that's kind of the setting for the Cold War. And that's why you saw a lot of other wars, like the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Those were really wars being fought between the United States and the Soviet Union proxy over wars. proxy wars between con the fight between communism and democracy. Um, so that's kind of to give you a little bit of background. But particularly in the 1950s and 60s, it was intense, mm -hmm. the, the, the conflict between communism and democracy. and what was happening is the Soviet Union and the United States were building these huge nuclear arsenals, and everyone was terrified that the conflict was just going to, it was just going to explode, and, and literally, and the world would be almost completely destroyed. So that is what you're going to learn about if you read this book, Fallout. It's going to tell you who all the, the players are. Um, there were a lot of spies from Russia and the United States at that time. And this, this tells you what we have learned about those spies and how they operated. But the United States was also developing these incredible aircraft and had our own spies in the ground. And we were flying over Russia and taking photographs of it. Um, so there was spying going on on both sides. It was a very tense situation. Yes. I think these books hit close to home too because I grew up in, during this period. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of this really, I remember the fear that we all felt. That's most of my books. The, the authors and their afterwards are like, 
Yeah, this is this is what I grew up in. Yeah, yeah. So that's all I'm going to say about this book. It's great. It's nonfiction, but it will read like a really great novel. Mm -hmm. Shaikin's the best. All right. Uh, and perfectly on the back of that, my first book is Red Menace by Lois Ruby. Um, so our main character here, Marty Rafner, uh, two of my three books feature um, Jewish boys gearing up towards their, their bar mitzvahs. That was unintentional, but, uh, and also set like 30 years apart. But yeah, so Marty, he loves the Yankees. He's always listening to the, the games on the radio. He's working towards his bar mitzvah. His parents are both professors. They live in a college town, kind of like we do. I'm sure there are some of you out there watching that both, both of your parents are professors. Um, at this time, this is, let me double check my dates here, I believe, 19, yeah, 1953. Um, so, this is right, right there in the, uh, the, it's the title of my next book, uh, Red Scare, McCarthyism, uh, the anti-communist, the whole shebang. So, Marty's parents have been asked by their college to sign a loyalty oath. All the, pro all the professors have been asked to sign this. Uh, at first, both of Marty's parents are like, no, that's un-American, this is ridiculous. Of course, I'm American, I shouldn't have to sign this. Uh, the next door neighbor, um, her, Amy Lynn, her dad is also a professor at the college, he's a math professor, and he also refuses to sign the loyalty oath. But then he gets called up by the House Un-American Activities Committee, which is, yeah, <laughs> yeah gotta go to uh, DC and testify before this committee. And basically it didn't matter whether or not you were guilty of being a communist. Guilty of being a communist. Um, basically, if you got called up, like, they thought you were a communist, it was gonna be terrible. Um, her dad gets fired before all this. It's, everybody's freaking out. Um, and eventually, Marty's dad does sign the loyalty oath, which is not a great time between the, his two parents. Um, and uh, Marty's mom is called up before the Internal Security Subcommittee of the U.S. Senate. So like slightly less, less terrifying than the other, but also they're like, mm, so you were born in Poland and your parents weren't citizens so you're not a citizen and since you haven't like told us you've been here this is illegal and like we're probably gonna deport you back to Poland and she's like my parents are naturalized citizens like come on now do you lose, lose the records of that all of a sudden um, it, it would seem that the records have been you know disappeared mm -hmm. um, and so there's this crazy big hunt to find the, the naturalization papers that that her mom's like, no, 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 we definitely did this. There is a photo somewhere of me and your father in Uncle Sam outfits the day we, we saw we pledged our oaths. Um, and in the background of all of this, because the family is Jewish, um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are historically two, a couple who were accused of being Russian spies and sent to death row and were eventually executed by the electric chair. Um, so, Marty's mom especially is like super up in arms against this. A lot of people were, like people, even the Pope was like, no, this is totally messed up, this is not okay. Um, it's kind of, I was telling Mary Lou, when I was reading it, I kind of felt funny because I was like, okay, I know these were real people, like what, what do we know now? Um, it, it turns out that now, I, I was telling you and you were like, oh, but like, are the, the records real? Uh, apparently some Russian documents got declassified. Uh -huh. And so, like, we do know that the Rosenberg. Julius Rosenberg, for sure, was pretty definitely a Russian spy. And so, it was kind of like, oh, because this entire book, they're like, oh, they're, they're innocent, they're innocent, this is just... Uh, they're looking for things that aren't there and, and now reading it in 2022 it's kind of like I mean should they have been murdered, killed? No, definitely not the, the execution, that's messed up but like, I don't know it, it just kind of felt funny to me because it's like well they were actually Russian spies or at least he was, definitively but 
It looks really good because it's, bless his heart, his parents and all the adults in his life have all these big issues and they're dealing with it. And he just kind of gets pushed to the side a little bit. They're, they're so worried about the status of his mom and whether or not she's going to get deported and whether or not she's going to be incarcerated. And it just, it's a mess. And he's like, have you, what do you, what do you but this all affects me. Why aren't you worried about that? Come on, be parents. Just sign the stupid loyalty oath because you not doing it is affecting me. I'm, I got kicked off my baseball team because they're, they think my parents are communists. It's just, it's, it's a whole mess. And there's a little subplot about a neighbor. Um, his name is, where I definitely wrote it down, but I don't see it there. Ah, there we go, Luke, um, who has come back from the Korean War and is dealing with some severe PTSD that Marty's, you know, he was really close to this guy. This guy was like an older brother to him. And he's trying to deal with the fact that Luke is, is a completely changed person now that he's come back. So it's really good. It deals with a lot of, a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of hard stuff that you can get by probably most of these do. So I'm so, uh, did it touch on how much oppression there were there, how much prejudice against Jews there were during that time period in America? Yeah. Jews were treated very badly in America. During yeah. That time. Um, yeah, not so much. It was more that his parents had been, well, especially his mom had been accused of being a communist, basically. Than mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it was that he was Jewish. Yeah. So, but yeah, oh yeah, definitely yeah. well, anti-Semitism. Well, this book, Spy Runner, was written by Eugene Yelchin, mm -hmm. who is a Russian immigrant to the United States, and he grew up during the Cold War in Russia, and he's just a delightful writer. I'm going to say he's probably a little bit younger than me. I'm not sure how old he is, but he's um, yeah, he's got no, he's got to be younger than me because he was he was still in Russia in the 1980s, and I was an adult by then. But he's so, but he's a, he's an older guy immigrated to the United States, um, I think in the 90s. And this book is called Spy Runner. <clears throat> and this is a book, um, you know, Kelly and I talk a lot about the books we're re as we're reading. Mm -hmm. and I, I read this, I think when it first came out. Yeah, she'd read it, and I said, I don't like this book at all. <laughs> I, I just like, laughed at her. <laughs> I don't like this guy, I don't like this character. This book is really uncomfortable. <laughs> so the kid, his name is Jake. And Jake is a handful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sure the guy, in the night in 2022 would be diagnosed with extreme ADD. He's just kind of hyper. He has no impulse control. He is always in trouble. Uh, his his scenario: He lives with his single mother, um, close to an Air Force base. His father was a pilot during World War II, and he disappeared, missing in action, uh, presumed shot down over Russia. And so Jake spends a lot of time. He never knew. His, he was born right before his father left for the war. So he, like, he has this one picture of his dad holding him as a baby, but that's the, that's the he, he never has known his father. And he spends a lot of time fantasizing about his father in a, in a labor camp in Siberia. Oh, yeah. And Jake wants to become a pilot, and he's gonna slip over into Russia, and he's gonna rescue his father. That's his, that is his dream. Um, he has one really good friend, Dwayne, who lives next door. They walk to school together every day. Um, Dwayne's father is a big hotshot dude in the in the Air Force. I can't remember what his position is. Uh, they're very wealthy. Um, they got they got a lot of nice things. It becomes important later. Um, but uh, so Jake lives with his mother, who is presumed to be a widow, and um, she works for a guy that makes window blinds. I believe it is. Anyway, uh, things start getting kind of weird. They, they had to have these daily lessons about, about America, and they had to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and, and, and there's a, this pervasive fear about communism, and the teacher, his teacher, Mr. Vargas, sometimes says things about maybe everything's not so great in America. <laughs> and, um, and, Dwayne's father, they, they have parents come in and talk about what they do and how to fight communism. All these kids are being recruited to fight communism. And his father comes in and you, know, you need to be watching out for spies. And, and, and anyway, um, he and Dwayne, I can't remember what, what provoked they've had a fist fight. Uh, oh, 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 no, okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have had my notes. His mother takes in a border mm -hmm. at their house. 
and he is a Russian immigrant. Mm -hmm. And he hears his mother saying, you know, how the owner of the business where she works is a very compassionate man, and these Russian immigrants are coming over after the war, and he's trying to find housing for them, so they are going to have this Russian border. And he, this, this border is upstairs in the, in, the, in the attic room that was his dad's space. It was kind of his dad's office, and he had all his pictures and all his belongings, and they've always kept it that way until this border comes. And Jake goes up there. He he is so furious. He's mad. Oh, he's so mad. And he takes all of this border stuff out and puts all of his dad's stuff back out. I mean, like his mother's cleaned it out. Well, Jake gets it, puts it all back out. But he's also convinced that this Russian guy is a spy. And he's going through his stuff. He's going through his clothes. He's trying to pull his shoes apart. Because right now, all these kids are reading comic books about spies, the spy runner comic books, and watching movies. And so they know what all these spies are doing. And um, I'm like, the whole time, I'm like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> That's so when Mary Lou was like, I hate this kid. <laughs> oh, God, leave this poor refugee alone. And, and you know, um, and then that's when Dwayne tells everybody that, that Jake's mom has got a communist living in the house. And Jake is suddenly like the social outcast. And he and Dwayne get the fist fight. And, and Jake has to go to the principal's office. And the principal, you can tell, is really scared. And he sees that the, the, the principal's got a tattoo in his arm, which means he's a refugee from the, the Nazi concentration camps. Um, well, and the teacher and the principal both all end up getting fired. But that's another story. Jake does, he is, starts being followed by this car. And eventually they catch him and they take him in for questioning. And they, they tell him, look, you're trying to be a you're trying to be a spy buster. You're just a kid. Leave it alone. We'll look after. It. But if you find anything, you call us and they give him a car. Well, I, this story gets so convoluted. Jake is being followed by some guy that's hanging outside of his house. He's got, got these two guys in the black car following. He has no friends. He starts skipping school because he's chasing all these spies down. And it, by the end, by the end of the book, you do not know who is who and what is what. Now it ends great. I love. I was so glad mm -hmm. I finished it. The ending is so good. It's so good. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. It's just. It's funny. It's it's thrilling, like a mm -hmm. good like a good spy thriller. And it's illustrated. And yes, it's illustrated. Eugene Yelchin is an artist as mm -hmm. well, and, and and which you may remember my wonderful talk about the artist who uh, the artist under the table, which was his memoir of growing up. But he does all these illustrations that, that go with the story. It's, it's so good. It's so good. <sighs> the book talking about it makes me hyper. Okay. All right. My next one. Like I said, Red Scare by Liam Francis Walsh. And yes, this is in fact a graphic novel. Um, and I love it. It actually focuses on a female protagonist while the other ones that I had were, were guys. So that also made me really happy. Our main character here is Peggy. She uh, had polio and is still recovering, so she has to use crutches. Uh, she has a twin brother named Skip. Um, her dad, their dad, was also in the Korean War and has come back. and. Uh, you slowly learn more about what has happened to him. I, it's a great subplot. Um, but basically you don't see him for most of the graphic novel. He's just like hiding out in the bedroom the whole time. Um, it starts, I have to, I have to show you. There's this, this page is just gorgeous. I love it so much. So there, there are some FBI agents and uh, Oh, it's so good. They're chasing this guy in a trench coat and a hat with a briefcase. And he jumps out the window and they're like, D where did, this is the sixth floor. It's like the guy just flew off. What is happening here? Um, so. What then is happening? Yeah. What is happening? <laughs> well, I can't tell you exactly because that's a huge spoiler. Yeah. Um, so. I can tell you short, sort of what happened. So the, um, the, where do I go back to? So, because Peggy's, uh, Peggy and Skip, her twin brother's dad, doesn't work at the moment. Her mom is, helps out cleaning at a local motel. Sometimes Peggy is dragged along to help as well. One day, Peggy is dusting, but she like pulls out a library book. She's reading a Ray Bradbury book, which, Obviously, she has excellent taste, um, and, but she uh, she ends up accidentally taking a nap, and she's laying in the room when um, 
someone is like, oh yeah, yeah, here's your room, blah, 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 here's the key. And uh, this spy, the guy that got away from the FBI, comes into the room, except you find out very quickly that he's been shot. And he, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Then when he was trying to escape through the window, he has been shot and is super bleeding. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he's he's hiding out at this motel, and Peggy is laying down on the other side of the bed and is like, I'm not gonna get out of here. But again, she's recovering from from polio. She's on crutches. She's not the easiest thing in the world. She does typically get out, but the guy's like, Hey, wait! Uh, she drops one of the crutches. She, she hears a clank after she's sitting on the stairs. Um, her other crutch is sitting outside the door. He, he left it there for her, so she goes back to get it and finds his body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, except when the cops uh, are questioning her afterwards, they're like, and that's where you found the deceased? Which is in quotation marks, and you're like, what do you mean, deceased? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so Peggy has a brand new next door neighbor whose name is Jess. They just moved to town. Um, Peggy is going to school. She hears kind of a funny rattling in her crutch and uh, pulls out what I can only describe as like a big old red glow stick um, that gives her superpowers, which she finds out when. Um, Maybe not like super flight, the power of flight. I, I, would, I mean, it's a superpower, but it's not like all the superpowers. It's the, she can fly now. Um, That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's also science fiction. But um, <laughs> yeah, so there are some guys that are, are messing with them, and Jess is like, hey, get on the back of my bike. And they do, and they run, they, they, they take off. The guys are on their bikes trying, the bullies are chasing them down. And they go in front of a train, and the train hits the bike, but then they're like, where are the girls? I know there were girls on that bike. Oh my gosh, what did we do if we killed these girls? But no, they're all flying, and that's how <laughs> Peggy discovers that she can fly. It's the greatest. Um, and there's just, oh, there's just so much more. And also there's this, like, one farmer guy that's, like, always reporting aliens ab above his field. And then at one point it's great because he walk, he, he's just been into the cops to report another one. They're like, okay, whatever, fill out the paperwork. It's fine. Again. And then he walks outside and he sees Peggy and Jess flying and he's like, he turns right back around and is like, I need to report some flying girls. <laughs> um, so the FBI, of course, is hounding her because they know that she was there with this guy and they know that the, the guy, the spy, has something and they really want it and it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's, uh, yeah. As in, I would say most of my books, at least, uh, it doesn't paint the FBI in a great light. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. It is really fun. It's really good. And it also has, I just, I love, is that a spoiler? No. Um, I just love that the illustrations are very classically, like, classic retro. comic book. Very retro. retro. Yeah. yeah. It just, it's great. Yeah. Well, I'm only going to talk about this so briefly, because I have talked about this book before. When mm -hmm. we first started doing book bites, our first uh, first uh, foray into um, historical fiction was the 1960s, which was during the Cold War. But we were kind of looking at some of the upheaval that was occurring during that time, particularly during the Civil Rights Movement. But this book was written in the 1960s. It's called Countdown, and it's a novel by Deborah Wiles. And this is unusual. I've never seen anything like it before, or really even since. It's called a docu-novel, novel, docu or novel documentary, something like that, novel documentary. It, wait a minute, I've got it here. It's a, new, a documentary novel, that's what it's called, that's the name for it. Because there is a story, a novel in here, but there's also chapters of nonfiction text, mm -hmm. lots of photographs. So she intersperses the, um, the story of the novel with entire chapters about what's going on during that time period. Mm -hmm. Factual, fact-based instrument and uh, stuff. What? Exit stage left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and lots of photographs, um, the Freedom Rides mm -hmm. South. Um, there's a beautiful photograph of John, uh, the, the late uh, John, Representative John Lewis, mm -hmm. 
who was such a, a, a hero of the civil rights movement. This is when he was a very young man. Um, but the story, I'll tell you briefly what the novel is about. It's about a girl named Franny. Uh, she lives near an Air Force base. Uh, and uh, this is in the 1960s. And her father not only works on Air Force One, but he, run, he is over the whole crew that runs Air Force One. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what Air Force One is, that is the aircraft that carries the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. So he has a very important and very uh, significant job. Franny uh, is, uh, her, her grandfather lives with them, or, I'm sorry, an uncle, so an uncle lives with them, who is a veteran of World War I, and he's got really severe PTSD. He kind of lives in the past. Uh, he's always preparing for war. He usually walks around with a gas mask and mm. uh, vests and stuff. And uh, as the Cold War is heating up, he is obsessed with building a bomb shelter in their yard. So Franny is, you know, the, you know, she's not, she's, she's not the most popular girl. She has a best friend, Margie, and there's a new girl that's in their class named Gail, who is so much more sophisticated. Her mother is divorced, which is just that. I will tell you, in those days, that was very rare. And Gail gets to wear lipstick already. She's 12, and Margie, Franny's best friend, has dropped her like a hot potato because she wants to be friends with this person. And there's all this kind of middle school drama going on, coming of age, and that part's just lovely and funny and awkward uh, while going on during this, but what makes it even worse is there is her uncle living with them in the front yard digging a bomb shelter and a gas mask, and how humiliating that is. Uh, so this is a really neat book about, and I'll tell you, we had a bomb shelter in our yard. My father built a bomb shelter. Oh. in our yard during this time period, during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. This book takes place during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you don't know what that was all about, that was when the Cold War really came to a head and it was, we came so close to mm -hmm. a nuclear war at that, at that moment. There were 10 days when Russia put nuclear weapons aimed at the United States on the island of Cuba, which is only 90 miles away from Miami, and the United States was ready to strike them if they didn't get the, the weapons off. So that, this book takes place during that time. It's, uh, it takes place during Halloween, and <laughs> all, all that month of October when all of this was going on. So wonderful book. It is part of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. There's two other books in this trilogy. Countdown by Deborah Wiles. Sorry, that was my <laughs> new All right, my last book uh, is <coughs> This is Just a Test by Madeline Rosenberg and Wendy Wanlong Shang. Shang? Shang? Oh dear, I'm not certain. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that there's an uncle digging a hole in uh, the front yard, because uh, you couldn't tell by the kids sticking out of the dirt. That's a bit of a plot point here. Um, but uh, our main character here, this book is, this book is really funny. So, we start off, David Dawei Horowitz is Jewish and Chinese. Um, which is an unusual mix in his town. And uh, our book starts in November, as we are not today, but when you watch this, you probably will be. Um, and his, his class has gone on a field trip to a farm, and they're all like, this is really dumb. There is nothing growing. Why are we here? To watch the slaughter turkeys, probably. I, no, 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 no. There's, there's no, no explanation. No, okay. no, right. they, they, no. They just, it's where they are, and um, this really, they're sitting at some tables. I think looking at seeds or something. And uh, one of the cool kids, Scott, is like, "Oh man, look at that tree. It's got these vines all around. I'm gonna climb it." So he starts doing it. I told Mary that because it was hysterical. I started reading it. And I was like, "Oh my gosh!" And then this other kid. Um, Terry follows and he's trying and David is like that vine is poison ivy <laughs> and David's best friend Hector who has like no filter he is unabashedly himself Hector is amazing uh, he's like hey that's poison ivy <laughs> and they're like no it's not and can you even if it is it's just the vine can you can you get it and they're like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the teacher they're like hey they touch poison ivy, and she's like, ugh, okay, just go with them, go make sure they wash up. The other kid, Terry, is like, nope, mm -mm, I don't care, I don't believe you, I'm not gonna wash up. He goes and um, 
uh, takes a pee around the side of the barn. Needless to say, he does not come to school the next day because he has poison ivy everywhere. Um, but Scott is pretty impressed. He's like, that's kind of cool that you knew that was poison ivy. Thanks. Like, you know, washing my hands, whatever. Like, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to go do it. So he does it. And then he's pretty impressed. He asks uh, David and, by extension, Hector to join him on uh, a trivia team for, for school. There's this big trivia contest. And uh, it reminded me a little bit like a team, academic team thing. And um, they're all like, oh man, Scott, he's like, he's like a cool kid. Okay, you know, this kid, this is gonna only be good for us. It's great. Um, but uh, Scott's not really a fan of Hector. So it kind of causes a little bit of a rift between David and Hector, which is just very sad. Um, and Scott, one of the, the, the rifts is that Scott is like, hey, come with me one day after school. And they go, it is, it is just Scott and David. And he's like, hey, my dad owns this house. It's, it's like, we use it as the rental property, whatever. I think we need to build a bomb shelter. Because one day when they were uh, training for their trivia game or competition, they saw the film the day after. Yeah, which is a real thing. I haven't seen it, but um, apparently it just like horrified the nation. Um, they suggested that children did not watch it alone, but it uh, sounds like a lot of them really did. Um, that's even in the afterward, the authors are like, yeah, we saw that and it messed us up, so we had to include it. <laughs> so basically what would happen after the fallout of a, a nuclear warfare? Which that maybe didn't warfare. come out until like the 80s or 90s? This is, this is set in 83. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Set yeah, in 83. I remember watching that movie. Ah. Oh. Yeah. And that's basically the reaction the kids had. So they're like, "Well, we need to build, we need to dig a dig a hole that we can hide in the backyard in case in case we have in case there's a nuclear fallout." Um, except Scott doesn't want anybody else. It's just him, him and David. And in the background, David, like I said, my my secondary character who's working towards his bar mitzvah, and um, he has he has his two grandmothers. One is his Chinese grandmother, Wai Po, who is very sassy, got herself probably intentionally kicked out of her apartment by picking up pine cones instead of her dog's poop. Um, so that it looked like she was picking up the poop, but she, she wasn't. Um, Cause then she moved in with their family and so she, she lives there, she's really close to them. And after that happened, his Jewish grandmother, um, who first goes by Granny M, and then eventually is like, nah, 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 it's not enough. You need to call me Safta, which is in a, one of the versions of, of grandmother in Yiddish. Um, uh, she lives around the corner now because she, of course, has connections to everybody. She's like, oh, yeah, this guy, they're going out of town for the, the year. And so all of a sudden they need to, to someone to watch the house. And it's like the neighbor's best friend's sister's mother's dentist or something. It's something insane like that. But like. She knew them and now they're family and so she moves in around the corner and they hate each other. These two grandmas are just always at each other's throats but they do it in like the polite way that's just like really sarcastic like oh I just love that you had to make Chinese food for this Thanksgiving dinner. So that's, there is a Thanksgiving in here and it is, it is hysterical. A neighbor comes over because he's all alone and he's just like I need to leave now. I need to go walk my dog. And David's like, I didn't tell anybody the dog's been dead for a whole year. <laughs> because these two grandmothers are at it. And especially when it comes to this bar mitzvah, they're always just trying to one-up each other. And then and, and Granny M, Safta, she, she has a sister that she's always trying to one-up. So when one of the sister's grandkids had a bar mitzvah the year before in New York City, and it's all these different things. And so one of them is like, you adopt, like adopt a twin and in the, the Soviet Union that can't have a bar mitzvah because they're, they're not allowed to practice. And, and so he has this, this Russian twin named Alexei that he's writing letters to and the grand, eventually the grandmother's like, oh yeah, there's no way he's actually reading those. The government totally took those letters. And he's like, well then why am I writing them? And they're like, no, 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 you, should, you need to still write those. You definitely need to do that. And it's just, it's a mess and it's hysterical and I love it and, and friendship messes. Oh, and also, um, he has this huge crush on the girl, on a girl named Kellyanne. Aww. Yeah. And, uh, except she spells it wrong, it's K-E-L-L-I. 
obviously. It's such good taste. Are. What a great name. Yeah, Mary Lou. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it it's great and and it's a mess and it's really funny and like literally the teacher is just like ah oh, yes. Next year you're going to read 1984 in 1984. <laughs> 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 very silly things like that. It's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. That's, I want to read it. Okay, <laughs> so our last book, and I'm just going to be brief. We've been talking a long time here. Mm. Is A Night Divided by Jennifer A. Nielsen. Mm. And you may know Jennifer Niel uh, Nielsen if you have read the Ascendancy trilogy, The False Prince mm. series. Now there's like five there's, of them now. There, yes, right. Started off as a trilogy, but she wrote in here. That were, I was supposed to be writing a trilogy, a fantasy trilogy, when I just really decided I had to write this book. <laughs> and now, right, the, the ascendancy is now five, five six books. At least, yeah. 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 But anyway, she writes great fantasy, but she also um, has started writing a lot of historical fiction, and her historical fiction is, is really, really good. And this one um, is about the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And again, I just want to remind you that after World War II, a lot of Europe was split between the East and the West. And Germany was basically cut in half between West Germany and East Germany, literally with a wall going up in the central city of Germany, Berlin, dividing the city in half. And there was West Berlin on one side of the wall and East Berlin on the other side. And if you tried to cross the wall, the, 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 it, was, it was patrolled by, heavily by armed military police that would kill you if you were trying to get either way over the wall. So uh, Goethe was eight years old when her uh, father, uh, they were living in the east side of Berlin before the wall went up, and um, he took uh, uh, one of Goethe's brothers with him to make a short trip to the west, and that uh, while he was gone overnight, the wall went up with no warning, literally overnight, and, and he could not get back. The book starts four years later when Gerda's about 12, and her, her, her mother, you know, they've just sort of given up hope that they'll ever be reunited with her father and brother. Uh, Gerda lives with her mother and with a, another older brother named Fritz. Fritz is 17 in this book, and that becomes significant because at 18, you either go to university or you, you sign up for the military. And mm -hmm. Fritz is a, a good, hardworking student. He really wants to go to university. After school, he works laying bricks to make a little bit more income for the family. Uh, mother works. Goethe goes to middle school. Uh, I think it's like six days a week. Um, and one day, and she has one best friend named Anna, and one day they're walking past the wall. They're walking by the wall, which is on their way to school. And Goethe is staring across the wall, which is dangerous. They mm. get in trouble for even just looking. Um, and Anna says, stop that, stop that. But Goethe notices there's a person standing on a platform on the western side of the wall, and she looks, and it's her brother. It's her brother, Dominic. And uh, I mean, they can't wave or anything. They can't draw any attention to it. They keep walking. Well, the next day, she looks again, and there's Dominic. And then Dominic looks down, and her father pops up. Okay? And then another time, they come, she goes by, and there's her father again. And he's singing and dancing. So I his head up on the wall. Yes. Yes. What's wrong with them? Yeah. And she watches, and he's, there was a song he used to sing to her every night before she went to bed. And he would, it was a song, a song about a farmer, and he would act out the motions of the, the farmer during his farm work. And that's, he's, he's, she knows he's doing that song, and he's digging. And he's digging. And, and when there, it, this happens several more times, and she realizes he's trying to tell her something. Mm -hmm. right? Why is he doing it? Well, in the meantime, Anna, her, her, her one good friend, has a brother, Peter, who is at university. And Peter and Fritz are friends, and Peter tells Fritz, I'm going to escape. I'm leaving tonight. There's some, Amer there's some West Berlin students over here. Mm -hmm. They've got a secret compartment in their car to smuggle people, and I'm leaving. When he gets caught, he gets killed. Mm -hmm. And when Anna finds out that Gerda knew, because Fritz had told Gerda, um, she was furious and and Fritz gets brought in for questioning, which if you get brought in by the police for questioning, oh, that's not good. he was beat. They beat him. They showed him this huge file that they have on him. They've been following him. They're, I did not mention that their father was involved in the resistance. Mm -hmm. He was very careful not to break laws, but he was involved in resistance. So they knew that. They've been watching the family. They have a file on Gerda already. 
because it turns out what they're going to learn is their house is bugged. Everything they say, they think they've been playing Beatles music in their bed in Fritz's bedroom, which is illegal, mm -hmm. and talking about how much they hate their government. Mm -hmm. All of that's been recorded. So then the next thing that happens is Gerda's mother leaves town for several weeks because their grandmother breaks her leg and their mother goes to take care of her. And that is when they figure out what her father is trying to tell them about digging. Mm. This book, it's not funny at all. No humor mm. in this book at all. It is, by the end of it, my heart was just, it was just pounding. It's, it's a great thriller. She's um, such a great writer. She's a good writer. The characters feel so well developed and the action is just, I mean, you will zip through it. I, I just I just couldn't put it down. Great book. Night Divided, Legend for Amy Nelson. Mm. We'll have these books on display in the twin yeah. area. So you can come by and grab with it our, with our with our flamingos, with our flags. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Yeah. We'll See you next month for some fantasy books. Fantasy again. Yeah. <laughs>